Now, most of you um, are familiar by now with this concept of the word cloud, I would expect. Uh, word clouds, you know, are those visual depictions of how frequently a word often appears relative to other words or themes um, in the major findings of a survey or a poll. Um, the visual graphic sort of looks like this. Uh, the more often a word appears, the more prominence it has in one's thinking or in a group of people's thinking about a topic. Now, if we were to build a word cloud around your memories of Swarthmore, I strongly suspect that like most every other Swarthmore alum, words like academics and rigor, faculty and research would loom large in your word clouds. Quaker values, collaboration, these are other words that are likely to loom large in a Swarthmore word cloud. But for Swarthmore student athletes, I suspect that some other words might also appear prominently. Words like teammates and spirit, leadership and perseverance, I think those would also appear as well. Those qualities of your Swarthmore experience that were directly connected to your lives as athletes have undoubtedly helped shape who you are, how you approach your lives and your livelihoods. I hope that every Swarthmore student graduates appreciating the value of those experiences and understanding just how significant they can be in helping to shape one's ability to lead in our personal, civic, and professional lives. I truly believe that athletic activity is not just an important part, but actually an essential part of a balanced life, the kind of balanced life that we are trying to promote among all of our students here, not only the student athletes. And athletic activity is not just about physical conditioning, about exercising regularly or staying in shape. Athletic competition offers the chance to flex a wide array of values muscles, self-discipline, hard work, the willingness to make sacrifices, the ability to recover from disappointments and setbacks, a commitment to a team, to getting along with others who have different personalities and styles for the sake of a larger common goal, a willingness to take risks and to test the limits of our abilities this is the essence of sport, and I firmly believe these are life lessons that our students acquire here that serve them throughout the course of their, of their personal and their professional experiences. Once they develop these values, they can't be confined to the athletic sphere. They infiltrate all aspects of life. They inform commitments to family and community. They support entrepreneurial success in the business world. They inform the ability to teach a child or provide medical care to someone who is sick or injured, to bring hope or comfort to some remote corner of the world as so many of our former athletes have done and continue to do. You might know that one of our recent student athletes, 2011 alumna Amy Vashel, who played both women's soccer and lacrosse, is now competing on The Voice. She's still testing her limits, exercising her creative muscles, living her values, and pursuing her goals. So athletics is ultimately about values. And tonight, we will celebrate those values as we honor those who have dedicated their lives to them. Some of our inductees are with us in person. Some are no longer with us. But I invite you to be challenged and inspired by all of them. So once again, thank you all for being here, and enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank you. So let me wish all of you a good evening, and a thank you for being here for what I hope will be a very memorable night. This past Wednesday, if you didn't know, marked a milestone in American culture as the date that the future finally became realized. You might remember back in the 80s, Marty McFly and Doc Emmett Brown hopping into their DeLorean time machine and back into the future too, and program their destination of October 21st, 2015, into the time machine. And while I'm pretty sure that the writers never intended to use the movie as a predictor of the future, they inspired a great deal over the course of some 30 years. Where am I going? I know. Similarly, 
when Swarthmore took to the field back in 1878 for their first intercollegiate game, I'm pretty sure they weren't thinking about how they might be shaping the future or about how their commitment to intercollegiate athletics could become the model for the future. I'm sure many of you here tonight, here in the Matchbox, which celebrates its first birthday in conjunction with this event, never would have imagined that your efforts in athletics would lead to this type of a transformation. Over the course of 137 years, that's exactly what you and so many others have done. All of the efforts on the field, courts, track, and pool have inspired younger generations to follow in your paths. I'm thrilled that we've accomplished so much in our history, and we now look forward to this annual event to remember our achievements of the past and celebrate some of the most memorable milestones. At the conference, regional, and national level, we've seen success at Swarthmore athletically. As athletes, you've earned the highest levels of academic recognition as well, gone on to outstanding professional careers, and brought distinction to the college community. I really look forward every year to working with our 11-member search committee to select the Hall of Fame class. It's inspiring uh, and a bit humbling when we get together to consider the incredible legacy of so many members of our family. Each year we discuss great stories and accomplishments and consider scores of nominations, del deliberating over the merits of each and the impact that they had. I give a lot of credit to the selection committee for their work and for the unanimous consensus to this year's class. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce to you the Garden Athletics Hall of Fame class of 2015. I got here really because of tennis. Um, the story goes, and I have no reason to dispute it, that uh, my class was picked. I wasn't in it. And my future coach, Mike Mullen, went to Bob Barr, who's the dean of admissions, and said, Bob, I really want to get this guy in. And I got an acceptance letter, and so I got in. And I think after my freshman year, they were actually both regretting that decision. Um, I was in engineering, not exactly tearing it up in engineering. Uh, in doubles, I hadn't made a return of serve all spring, uh, but things got better. And uh, I came to see after that, that little bump in the road, Swarthmore was the perfect place for me. I got a fantastic education. I got to play and have some success at a sport that I love. Um, and I made some lifelong friends, a uh, few of whom are here tonight, mostly to celebrate Ernie, but they are my, my friends here as well. Kristen couldn't be here tonight. But she sent me her speech so I could share her feelings about this honor tonight through her words. So I'm just going to read this. Imagine this is Kristen. <laughs> Good evening. I am thrilled, touched, and humbled to be chosen for this honor. While family issues prevent me from sharing in the joy of this event personally tonight, I am flattered. Everything about this evening is a treat, but I think the best part for me lies in all the Swarthmore memories it's brought ba rushing back. I suspect I'm part of a pretty large club when I describe myself as someone who absolutely loved my experience at Swarthmore. In trying to explain that fondness to people, I hear myself pointing to the sense of connection and community I felt with my classmates and teammates, my professors and coaches, staff members and administrators. Swarthmore is a community where people are good to one another. Maybe that sounds simplistic, but I loved my teammates and my coaches for knowing and caring about me, and I loved them for letting me know and care about them. Went to a nice prep school, <clears throat> had an Ivy League education, and I worked at two of the finest colleges in the country, Harvard and Swarthmore. For four years, I did it. And you know, I always liked Swarthmore because they're progressive. They don't say, this is the way it is, we're gonna do this way. We keep getting new people in, great administrators, great uh, boards and everything else. And what I did, I checked on Valerie. I talked to my friends at Princeton, I said, what the scoop on this Valerie? <laughs> I did, absolutely. And they got the word from, from those people said, you got a good one. <laughs> they, they say she's an academic person, hard worker, everybody likes her, 
and she gets the job done. There you go. How can you have anything better than that for Swarthmore College? <clears throat> and so uh, <clears throat> here I am. I did all these things. And tonight, this award is like icing on a cake. How can this happen to me? I can't believe it. It's just, just wonderful. It's wonderful to be here. And, uh, and when, when the presidents, ex-presidents talk, even the Pope got into the act, he always say, they always say, good night, and thank God for, for uh, the United States of America. And I say to you, good night, and thank God for Swapper College. I've always been a really fortunate person. And um, I had the right parents and grew up in a little town. And fortunate because I was always a gifted student and a gifted athlete. And I had a lot of shortcomings, but those weren't two of them. So when I was in high school, I would read the Philadelphia Bulletin. It no longer exists. But they had a female woman, a uh, female woman's redundant, a woman sports writer by the name of Helen O. Mankin. And she wrote about the women's sports activities in the Philadelphia area. And so I would read about Swarthmore and other colleges, but I knew Swarthmore was what I wanted academically. And so I was very fortunate that I came to Swarthmore. I loved every minute that I was here, both academically and athletically. And I have remained devoted to this college, always and always will be. Jim was old school. He thought you played a sport hard, and he was a hard, tough player. Uh, if you win, you shake the hand of the team you lost. And if you lost, you went over and shook their hands, and that's the way you played. He was a gentleman at all times. And he was a rather, rather quiet, unassuming person. But when he got on the cardboard, he was, a, he was a tough, tough competitor, as was Joe and those other guys. Um, so they went on to do very well as a team, Adam, as you know. Won the conference championship. Uh, they wanted Swarthmore to be really recognized as a, as a power, really, in basketball. And I think they were for a number of years there anyway. The 1905 men's lacrosse team claimed the Intercollegiate Lacrosse Association National Championship for the second consecutive year, finishing with a record of 7-1. and one. This team had veterans in key offensive positions who had experienced success the year before. Eight of the Garnet's 12 athletes also played for the 1904 National Championship team that finished with a record of 10-1. and one. Offensive standouts Philip Lamb, Wilmer Crowell, Reginald Price, Percy Hoops, William Linton, and defender and two-year captain, Archer Turner, were joined by a new goalie, Pierre Seaman, to start the 1905 season. The team relied heavily on physical conditioning and teamwork. According to the 1905 Halcyon, Coach Davis again rendered his able services, training new men to fill vacancies so that the team would work more nearly as a unit. It was undoubtedly through this superior teamwork and greater physical endurance that we, we were able to go so speedily to the front." End of quote. 